Hi guys, so the Work and Pension Secretary, Therese Coffey, was attending a select committee where she was asked about a number of issues. I want to highlight in this video two areas where I found her answers quite surprising. The first is how poverty is measured and the second was on the uplift to universal credit. That £20 that has been helping people, a great number of people over the last year, but is going to be phased out in a few months time. Before we get to Miss Coffey, I want to talk about the difference between absolute and relative poverty. Absolute poverty is when household income is below a certain level, which makes it impossible for the person or family to meet basic needs of life, including food, shelter, safe drinking water, education, healthcare, etc. In this state of poverty, even if the country is growing economically, it has no effect on people living below the poverty line. Absolute poverty compares households based on a set income level, and this level varies from country to country depending on its overall economic conditions. While relative poverty is when households receive 50% less than average household incomes. So they do have some money, but not enough money to afford anything above the basics. This type of poverty, on the other hand, is changeable depending on the economic growth of the country. People in relative poverty can have phones, TVs, fridges, dishwashers, etc. They are the aspects of modern life but they are stuck in a state where even if they are working, they are struggling to make ends meet. Sadly, the public tend to only think in terms of absolute poverty, which can have dangerous consequences. Um, you've made clear, Secretary of State, for example, in your letter to us dated the 26th of March this year, and, and the Minister for Welfare Delivery made the same point when he came a couple of weeks ago, um, that and I'm quoting your letter, the government believes that absolute poverty is a better measure of living standards than relative poverty. Why do you take that view? I think relative, is, um, relative incomes is a statistical measure which genuinely just moves around. And I think it's quite highly likely that once we're through the statistics that reflect the last year, we may well end up with actually relative poverty falling considerably. And so it's about trying to keep it real. I suppose, is more of the uh, element there. So, you know, the vast majority of the British population do not accept the concept of relative income being the driver of whether somebody is poor or not. That the, so she's going off what the general public think, not what is actually the reality. Shown in the British Social Attitude Survey. Um, and uh, so, so it's for that reason I understand the technical and statistical reasons um, but it's why I strongly believe it's not the right approach. Um, amongst children, the most recent data for relative poverty, uh, which is for 2019-20, so just before the pandemic, shows it at the highest level for 12 years, whereas absolute poverty has continued on a, a generally downward trend. Are you troubled by the rise in relative poverty amongst children? Well, I'm conscious that um, in the 2016 Act, we committed to keep publishing certain statistics. Uh, I don't know the reason at the time why the government decided to keep relative in, given the direction from travel very, very early on um, of the administration, the coalition administration in the 2010-15 government was to move to focusing on the absolute poverty measure that we have. Now, you can probably ask, why did the government focus on absolute poverty and not relative po poverty? Well. Maybe this is the reason. You can see here, absolute poverty level in the UK between 2019 and 2020, it says here 9.2 million people, 14% are in absolute poverty. Well, if we compare it to the numbers in relative po poverty, it says 11.7 11 million people in relative poverty, 18% of the population. So if you focus on the smaller number, then you say, well, we're succeeding. Everything is going well. If you ignore the bigger number, then you're avoiding the problem. So, of course, the government would focus on uh, absolute poverty instead of relative poverty. And also, they're able to continue this narrative that, well, you know, if somebody has a phone, they're not poor. If somebody has a TV, they're not poor. If somebody has a dishwasher or a washing machine, it means that they're not poor. And this seems to be something that's been copied from right-wing media in the United States. Fox News, for example, runs stories on a 
pretty regular basis about how there is no poverty. If somebody has a phone, then they're not poor. Many people have the basics, as I said before, the basics to live. Dishwasher, washing machine, to wash clothes, uh, a phone, you need a phone today. That does not mean that you're poor, that does not mean that you're rich. It, it, many people are struggling from one week to the next to pay bills, to survive. They are in poverty. But if the government are able to ignore one aspect of poverty, they can get away with it. Um, but uh, you know, I'm very keen that we do what we can to just improve general standards of income regardless, uh, depending and not necessarily base it on what, how many other people are, um, uh, are, are, what they are earning, I think is the best way of putting it. Can I uh, put to you then this, that not long after he became leader of the opposition in November 2006, David Cameron delivered the, the Scarman lecture. And he talked quite a lot about this point. Let me just quote a couple of things he said in that lecture. He said, in the past, we used to think of poverty only in absolute terms, meaning straightforward material deprivation. That's not enough. We need to think of poverty in a relative terms. The fact that some people lack those things which others in society take for granted. So I want this message to go out loud and clear. He said, the Conservative Party recognises, will measure and will act on relative Poverty. So I, I'm wondering, I mean, is the position that you're putting to us, uh, is, uh, has the Conservative Party reverted to its pre-David Cameron position? Well, I can't speak for David Cameron. I'm not aware of that speech. What I do know is when he was Prime Minister, the focus of the coalition government was much more on the absolute poverty. And as I've indicated to the committee before, um, it's interesting the parts of the element that um, David refers to is about what other people take for granted and i think that's what actually drives aspects of material deprivation uh, people are concerned that, about what it is they feel that people should have um, and that's why the questions that are in there will be things about aspects of referring almost to quality of life it's not just about whether you have a coat for winter but some of the things that perhaps the majority of um, of the population assume um, should be standard, like going on holiday or, or something like that. So um, I can't account for David Cameron's uh, change of views when from 2006 to then the direction of the government he led. Which is very interesting that you had a Tory, David Cameron, considering other aspects of poverty. Now, unfortunately, it seems that the government decided to drop one of those measures. Now, I want to leave poverty for a moment and get on to universal credit. So the Secretary of State was also asked about universal credit and this uplift. So let's hear what she had to say. Thank you. Nigel Mills. Thank you. Secretary of State, could you just update the committee on the £20 a week temporary uplifting universal credit and what your plan is for October in relation to that? Well, ahead of October, we will start communicating uh, with the um, current claimants who receive uh, the £20 uh, to make them aware that uh, that will be being phased out and they will start to see an adjustment in their um, payments. Uh, in, I think it really kicks in largely in October, but it will start to kick in, uh, I think, towards late September for some people. So the, uh, the current proposal is that we will be recognising uh, that this was brought in in line with the temporary measures uh, to support people during the COVID pandemic. It's being phased out in line with all the other temporary measures that are also being uh, removed. So you're resigned to the fact that the Treasury <laughs> won't be giving you the money to continue this for the rest of the financial year, at least you're not even asking for that and making submissions, you're just accepting that. Is that um, fair? Of course, the question here is, are you fighting for the people who are on universal credit? Are you fighting to maintain this uh, uplift? Of course she's not. She doesn't care. But let her, let's hear what she had to say. A collective decision was made within government to make sure that that £20 uplift was extended for the six months. Uh, and uh, that is being honoured. Uh, but collective decision was made that as we see the economy open up, 
we shift the focus uh, strongly into getting people into work and jobs and we'll also be can helped by considering, considering some of the proposals coming out of the independent uh, commission looking into in-work progression because uh, that's an important part of how we help people get up the careers ladder all the things that we can do to help people work more hours as we see more and more people come off tax credits onto universal credit we'll no longer have the 16 hour cliff edge so we're discussing with some of our you know, major employers across the country who had re redesigned a lot of their work contracts to fit with that 16 hours actually about making them aware and indeed people on so basically she didn't fight for this uplift she didn't care she she's presenting the idea that well you know we don't need it anymore it was a temporary measure get people back into work take away this 20 pounds uplift now you probably want to well maybe that's her job well let's have a look at her voting record whether she actually does care about people at the bottom people are on universal credit people are on welfare how did uh, how Theresa Coffey voted on welfare and benefits? It says here, consistently voted for reducing housing benefit for social tenants. Almost always voted against public spending to create jobs for young people. Consistently voted for making local councils responsible for helping those in financial need. Uh, of course, as I said before, offloading responsibility from central government to local government. Consistently voted against raising welfare benefits at least in line with prices. So as prices go up, prices go up, she voted against increasing benefits in line with that. So just imagine the price of bread, the price of milk, the price of um, gas, electricity, these things go up. So you would imagine that the welfare benefits would go up in line with that, at least in line with that. And she voted against that. And she's the Work and Pensions Secretary consistently voted for a reduction in spending on welfare benefits. 52 votes for and zero votes against. So every time a vote came in to increase welfare benefits, she voted against it. Every time, apart from twice when she was absent. But we could probably count that down as 54 votes against consistently voted against paying higher benefits over longer periods for those unable to work due to illness and disability. 15 votes against, zero four. So when she comes out and says, we need to get people back into work, we have this, uh, you know, we have this amazing system called universal credit. This is all hot air. She doesn't believe it. It's all lies. And unfortunately, she gets away with it. Unfortunately, when she's uh, interviewed in the media, she's not challenged on these things. I wish journalists would challenge these people on their voting record because they can say whatever the hell, whatever the hell they want in Parliament. They can say whatever the hell they want uh, to the media. But it's their voting record that we need to monitor. Let me know in the comment section, guys, what you think. As always, your comments are greatly appreciated. Thanks a lot. I want to say a big, big thank you to all of my patrons. You ensure that this channel continues to exist. I'm eternally grateful for all of your support. If you join Patreon, you will receive instant access to our Discord server, where we have both audio and video chats. You can chat with me and other patrons, where we discuss important and non-important issues. Becoming a patron per month costs about the same as a large coffee. So why not check it out?